الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين ولا عدمان إلا على الظالمين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وقد نسأل الله سبحانه وتعالى العلم النافع رزقا طيبا وعملا متقابلا أمين We begin inshallah ta'ala tonight's lecture inshallah ta'ala We're opening up with a dua asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us all beneficial knowledge This is a dua that we constantly are in need of a dua which the Prophet Sallallahu is reported to have said after Salatul Subh or Salatul Fajr. And ask Allah for halal wholesome provisions. And also for actions which are accepted. Tonight's talk be ithnillahi ta'ala. Just to mention this. It's really not. The reason for tonight's talk is not anything in particular. It's just a reminder be ithnillah to all of us about the importance of sabr, of patience, and the causes which leads to talaq, divorce and separation between spouses. This is why we chose to title this particular talk, The Destruction of Nikah. All right? And oftentimes you find that nothing destroys or harms the marriage more than low tolerance and lack of patience for each other. And we're going to look at some selected verses in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which Allah highlights the importance of us understanding patience in the role that it plays um, in keeping the marriage intact, in keeping the relationship intact. We're also going to examine some of the statements of the Salaf. Um, in regards to patience as well To give us a broader understanding be the lap, Of the importance of patience Which sometimes most of us overlook And we hear the word patient a lot You know And we might remind or advise one another with patience Except when it comes to ourselves And we don't know how that patience is to be carried out So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Under no uh, to ask us to, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to benefit, to grasp the information, to retain it, and to play and to put it into practice if we can. The verses and questions that we're going to look at specifically today is verses in Surah An Nisa and how befitting since we're talking about marriage, right? So in the beginning of Surah An Nisa, not the very beginning, but in the beginning, which is the 19th verse. To the twenty-first verse, Allah subhanahu wa taala says the following: "A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim. Ya ayyuha ladina amanu la yahillu lakum an tarithu nisa akaruha, wa la ta'dulu hun li tadhabu bi ba'zi ma ateetumuhun illa an yatin bi fahishatim mubayyina." وَعَاشِرُوهُنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ فَإِنْ كَرِهْتُمُوهُنَّ فَعَسَىٰ أَنْ تَقْرَوْا شَيْئًا وَيَجْعَلَ اللَّهُ فِيهِ خَيْرًا كَثِيرًا وَإِنْ أَرَدْتُمُ اسْتِبْدَالَ زَوْجٍ مَكَانَ زَوْجٍ وَآتَيْتُمْ إِحْدَاهُنَّ قِنْطَارًا فَلَا تَأْخُذُوا مِنْهُ شَيْئًا أتأخذونه بمتانا وإثما مبينا وكيف تأخذونه وقد أفضى بعضكم إلى بعض وأخذنا منكم ميثاقا غليظا In these following verses Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala He says and we're going to use the English of the noble بإذن الله O you who believe, Allah addresses the believers first and foremost, those with Iman. You are forbidden to inherit women against their will. You are forbidden to inherit women against their will. And you should not treat them with harshness 
that you may take away part of their mahr you have given them unless they commit open illegal sexual intercourse and for those who are listening or watching if you don't know what the mahr is it's loosely translated as the gift that you give to the woman which is her hak and the right to marry her okay sometimes people say bridal money um but it is the gift given from the groom to the bride all right to marry her be ethnillah and it can be in the form of money it can be in the form of other things as well um however allah jalla says do not treat them with harshness that you may take away part of the mahar you give them something and you take it away from them right something you have given them unless they commit open illegal sexual intercourse and live with them honorably okay if you dislike them it may be that you dislike a thing and the law brings to it a great deal of good but if you intend to replace a wife by another and you have given one of them a kintar here in Provincy, it means a gold such a large amount a great amount of mahar take not the least bit of it back would you take it wrongfully without right and with a manifest sin and how could you take it back while you have gone into each other and they have taken from you a firm and strong covenant it's not the time to go deep into those verses we're only going to be looking at verse 19 <laughs> unfortunately we're not going to be looking at verse 20 and 21 tonight bismillah because verse 19 contains the actual meat that we need for this particular talk but before going into those verses verse 19 in the fawaid containing to it we would like to go into some of the statements of the salaf in regards to patience okay and we want to examine some of their statements starting from the sahabas going on down statement of umar ibn al-khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu which is reported that he have said in the afdal aish adraknahu bis sabri walaw anna sabra kana min ar-rijal kana karima right and we hear these statements and be like okay this you know it's deep it's poetic it's you know it's something cool and fly to even share and you know spread it in the text put it in the meme and we say these statements but in real life if we were to actually take time just to ponder and reflect on these statements we would see the wisdom contained in those statements and and try and apply them to our actual lives um so Umar ibn al-Khattab, he says, In the afdal, indeed, most certainly, the life in which you live, right, the best of it, is that whatever you come across, whatever you experience throughout it, that you meet it with patience. And this reminds me of the statement of Luqman, alayhi salatu salam, to his son. Wasbi ala ma asabek. Be patient with whatever befall you. Be patient with whatever befall you. Also, the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya you ladina amanu sta'inu bi sabri wa salat. In the Allah ma'asabirin, O you who believe, seek help and uh, do assistance through both patient and prayer. Indeed, Allah is alone with those who are patient. If you analyze this statement, Umar ibn Khattab is saying that the best way to get through life is with patience. The best way to experience life is through patience. Then he goes on to say, sabra kana min rijal kana karima. And have it been the case that this patience was practiced by the men, then that man will be honorable. Do you understand? That person will be honorable if it been the case that this person will practice sabra. Sabra, as the ulama mentioned, is nisfuddin. As Ibn Qayyim has a tremendous book on the deen being divided into two halves. One is shukr and the other half is patience. As he mentioned in that book, that patience is mentioned over 90 times in the Quran. Patience is something that we all, wallahi to Allahi, wallahi, we all need to work on. Whether you're married or not married. And especially if Allah bless you, because it's all from Allah's blessing to have a family. If Allah bless you to be married, then you need to have patience. Do you understand? Your patient needs to go up a notch with yourself, with your spouse, with the children that Allah bless you in the marriage, whether it was from the wife before you married her, or whether it's from the, the children that y'all brought forth together. Do you understand? Or whether it's from the children you have before you married her. Patient is required. 
While even Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he says something also profound. Ali ibn Abi Talib, he says, Ala inna sabra min al-iman bi manzalat al-ra'si min al-jasad wa qata' al-ra'sa bada jasad thumma rafa'a sawtahu faqal ala innahu la iman liman la sabrun lahu Major, right? He says that indeed patience is from iman. Ali ibn Abi Talib is informing us that to have patience it is a part of Iman. Part of your belief in the law is to be someone who practices patience. He said, and it takes the position of the head to the body. You know, you have the head to the body. Iman is like the head to the body. If you cut off the head, you already know what's going to happen. The body going to fall, right? If you take away the Iman from the individual, not the Iman, I mean the sabra from a person. If you cut off the head, the body's going to fall. If you remove that patience from a person's iman, you will cripple him. You will cripple her. Then he raised his voice. He elevated his voice. And he said that indeed there is no iman for the one who does not have patience. SubhanAllah. Look what he said. There is no iman for the one who does not have patience. Let's go for the wife. Let's go for the husband. Let's go for the children. Let's go for everyone. Do you understand? There is no iman for the one who do not exercise patience. Okay? It was reported on behalf of Ibrahim Atami, rahimahullah. He said, Ma min abdin wahab Allahu lahu sabrun ala adha. That there is no servant whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed patience upon him dealing with a harm. وَصَبْرٌ عَلَىٰ بَلَائِ And having patient dealing with a trial Meaning a test He says وَصَبْرٌ عَلَىٰ مَصَائِبِ And also having patience dealing with any type of calamities Right? He says إِلَّا قَدَ أُوْتِيَ أَفْضَلُ مَا أُوْتِيتُهُ أَحَدُ Except that he will be given Right? That which is the best that has been given to anyone Ba'd al-imana billah After having belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala So in this statement, if you didn't catch it He's telling you that patient Is the best thing that a servant can have After having belief in Allah After believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Patient is the best thing that you can have After having iman Alright That there is nothing Because to face calamities To face trials To face hardships To face anything that we face in this, in this world it's going to have to be met with, um, with patience. The last statement I'm going to bring is going to be from a Sha'bi. He said that Sharia, he mentioned that inni la asab bil musibah. He says that indeed, when I am afflicted with any calamity in my life, fa ahmad Allah alayha arba'u marrat. Pay attention to this. He said, then I praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for four things. Four times. He said, I praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Four times Now let's look at this here He's talking about being afflicted with a calamity How many of us And myself included When we are afflicted with something Do we begin to praise Allah Does that make sense I'm being tested right now As I'm thinking of praising the law for being tested <laughs> How many of us say Qaddar Allahu ma shafa'ala As an afterthought And not as it's required for us to say Alright because if you said it with Iman and when it was required for you to say, then it should calm you down. Yes. Right? It should allow you to surrender to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed. Right? But how many of us begin to praise Allah? Here he's talking about praising Allah four times. Not just one time. He's saying, I praise Allah four times when something befalls me from a calamity. That's <laughs> what Allah thing. He says, Ahmed. I praise him idlam yakun a'adhamu minha. The first thing that I praise him for is that if this thing which he has afflicted or or test or trialed me with, this calamity, that there's nothing greater than it. I Meaning in other words, he don't hit me with something else greater than what he just tests me with this calamity. Meaning that I praise him for not giving me something greater than that. 
You tried and test me with this and by not giving me more on top of this. You understand? He says, Wa Ahmed Id Razakani Sabra Aliha. And I also praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second thing he says I praise him for, for giving granting me the provision to be patient. Here he calls Sabra risk. Razakani provided me with the patience during the trial. Which teaches that what? Patience during any test or calamity don't come from you, it comes from Allah. I repeat that again for you. Patience during any type of calamity doesn't come from you, it comes from who? It comes from Allah Azza wa Jalla. This is extremely important because a lot of our marriages are destroyed because of this very, very key component, which is supper. And you can tell me if I'm lying, which is supper. From both of the spouses, from one of the spouses, Patient is lacking, low tolerance is there. And if we don't understand this issue of patience, we're not going to really understand the beauty that it plays and the role that it plays in keeping our marriages intact. All right? Tell you. He says the third thing, Wa Ahmed Id, Wa Fakoni Lirustija, Lima Araju Minathawab. He says the third thing I praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for is to grant me the tawfiq. To say the itastija. Alright. Now you might have heard this saying, you know what it is, you probably don't know what the name is it for, but it's to say inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. This is not to just be said when someone died. Unfortunately, we are accustomed to saying this statement when someone's died, when someone died or passed away. That's not actually in the hadith what it's supposed to be said for. Alright? It's said for any calamity. That befalls you. Any calamity that befalls you, it's normally supposed to be said. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. Indeed to Allah we belong and indeed to Allah we will return. Right? This is irastija. So he says, I praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guiding me, granting me the tawfiq to actually say it. And I hope by me doing that, I will ascertain his reward for it. Right? And then he said, last but not least, I praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the fourth one. He says, if he does not make this calamity be something within my deen. So if he tests me with a worldly affliction, a worldly trial, a worldly hardship, that is okay. As long as he don't test me with a hardship within my deen. In other words, he don't test me with doubt in my deen. You understand? He tests me with something from the worldly things. So I praise Allah on all of these different levels. It's just go to show you how king they were in reflecting on the beauty of patience. In the verse that we quoted in Surah Nisa, that's Surah 4 by the way, verse 19. Verse 19. The benefits in these verses, brothers and sisters, is that one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he prohibited the prohibition of inheriting women according to a manner which they dislike. Inheriting here does got nothing to do with wealth. It's not like when we talk about inheritance with wealth. That's not what it means here. Here Allah Jalla wa Allah prohibit you to actually do something to women which they don't like. You understand? Doing something to your wives which they do not like. Okay? You have to be king and careful not to do that. Kama yajudi fil jahiliyyah. As that used, which used to occur during the time of jahiliyyah. Whereas though if one person will pass away. Then what they would do is the woman cannot get married unless they marry her off to someone they choose or who they like. And that's how they would normally do it. So they would inherit the woman against her will. Right. In other words, they would force her to do things that she didn't like to do. Right. Because women then was treated like cattle. Not like how now this, you know, with the feminist movement. And it's unfortunately and sad, man, that many of the Muslims who say they believe in Allah and the messenger really think like a feminist. Is this if when you say something to them, they get offended. If you was to say a statement as such as <laughs> woman cook. No, men gotta cook too. Women clean. You know, men gotta clean too. It's as if it's by default you have to say that. Not to mention the fact that the Prophet Sallam helped around his own up helped around the house. Not to mention that he mended his own clothes, he he took you know what I mean, he he cleaned and not to mention all of that, but why do you have to mention that? What is the need or necessity that you have to mention that? Besides the fact that the domain for the woman is the home. Right? So why do I have to mention the equal footing there? Right? Why? If, because if you don't mention it, what's left unsaid is that you're a sexist. You see? Right? You're, you're stuck in the stone age. You're trying to put women down. You're trying to... 
right? Sisters, free Allah. Study Islam. See what Allah says about you. See what the Messenger وسلم, says about you authentically. And understand your role. And respect your role. Regardless of what these women are saying today, respect your role. It is Izzah. And no one can give you Izza like your Lord. No one has honored you more than your Lord. No one has gave you high esteem more than your Lord. No one has placed you in a greater position more than your Lord. Okay, so don't lose perspective of that. Tayyip, he goes on, he says, Due to the fact that Allah says, La yahillu lakum, It is not permissible for you. In other words, it is prohibited for you. It is forbidden for you, O men. Even though Allah addresses the believers, He's talking about the husbands. O men of Iman, O believing men, believing husbands, do not inherit the woman against their will. The second benefit is that the negation of hill, of, the, of, of here being permissible, what's intended by it is the prohibition. All right? And that is because when a thing is negated, it confirms or it affirms or establishes opposite. Okay? The third benefit is that if the woman is were to be inherited towards a manner in which she was pleased with, then there's no problem in that case. If you did something to a wife, to your wife, or to the woman, period, in general, and they, and it actually wasn't going against something they disliked, then it was okay. If they like it and agree with it, it's okay. However, the restriction there would be according to what is pleasing in the legislation. All right? According to what is pleasing the legislation. For example, he says, if you were to, for example, she was to marry your um your cousin, right? Or she, she was to marry your cousin. Then in that case, there was no problem, right? If to marry your hello to 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 marry the wife of your brother after his death with her pleasure, meaning she's pleased with that, for you to marry her, and also with a legislative contract, then there is no problem in that as well. The fourth benefit is the prohibition of being harsh towards women, treating them wrongfully without due right. All right? In order to cause her to ransom herself. And, he, you know, in other words, he's talking about, you know, khula, and he's going to mention this. Because Allah says, Wala ta'aduluhunna, and do not treat them with harshness, in order to take away something that you're already giving them of the mahr. The fifth benefit is that it points to that it is not befitting that the khul'a be greater than what was given to her. It is not befitting that the khul'a be greater than what was given to her due to the fact that Allah says be ba'ab with some, with part of. All right. He's saying it's not befitting. However, there is a difference of opinion concerning this. And I didn't even know this until I'm reading this tough, uh, this tough seer right here. That the ulama, they actually are divided into three opinions in regards to the woman giving back the mahar that was given to her. Can she give back more or do she have to give back more than what was given to her, right? Actually, interesting enough, there are three positions. Some scholars, they say it's permissible. Some say it's impermissible and some say it's disliked. The Sheikh doesn't elaborate on it. I'm not going to go into elaboration of it neither. Type. He says, also, here we see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala divides his address. How he speaks to the husbands and the believing men, and you know, specifically, when he says, do not in, um, inherit women against their will. Uh, also, and then Allah says, Wala ta'duluhunna. He says, if we look at the word la, and I'm going to skip past this because he's going to go into an Arabic benefit. Um, in regards to understanding that la there Is that la is a prohibited la Or is it a ne negative la And if it's a negative la Then it comes in kavi This meaning if it's prohibited la He's going to go into all of that Alhamdulillah Right The Seventh benefit Is that the sadaq In other words Sometimes the word mahar Can also be known in the Quran As a sadaq Okay I know we're going to talk about this I didn't finish this But it is a sadaq Lil mar'a And it is a right Giving the woman the mahar is her right. A brother can't come in and finesse his way into a woman without giving her mahar, period. You have to give her mahar. Agreeing on um, a date when to give, that's something permissible that can be done. Um, 
working to it. And it's also an agreement between both the husband, uh, the bride, and the groom. All right? Of course, the Wali would play a part in it, but it's an agreement that takes a place between them. Do you understand what I mean by that? In other words, whatever they agree on in that term of what's being given, whether it's a large amount or a small amount, <clears throat> if they agree and they both please with it, it's okay. All right? It's okay. And the reason why, and I'm not going into that already, the reason why, because of the verse where Allah Jalla wa Allah says, the 20th verse, Allah Jalla wa Allah, He says in that verse, وَإِنْ أَرَدْتُمُ اسْتِبَدَالَ زَوْجٍ مَكَانَ زَوْجٍ وَآتَيْتُمْ إِحْدَاهُنَّ كِنْتَارِ And if you look at the word kintar, kintar is gold, like we said, a large amount of it, a great amount of it. Which the ulama, they argue in this verse to show that the permissibility of the mahar being a large sum. So you can give, there is no limitation on the mahar. You know I mean, there's no narration that comes to limit it, the actual mahar. And even if the athar of Umar ibn Khattab is true, then we will look at that athar when he stood up and say that no one can give a mar greater than what the Prophet Sallallahu gave his wives. And then a woman who stood up and said, Ya Ras, uh, uh, Ya Amir al Mu'minin, oh, then what about the verse? And she quoted the verse I just recited, where Allah says, If you give them a kintar, and then Umar is reported to have said, She has more fiqh than me in this issue. All right, so the ulama they, they say that if that athar is true, it shows you that what the mahar can be given on a greater scale. All right, la best. I don't want to go into too much of that. All right, now it's their right, it's her haq. All right, and indeed, it already proceeded in the beginning of this surah that which is clear, very clear, that the sadaq is the right of the woman, and the statement that Allah says, wa nisa and to give the woman their sadaqat and nihla. at any rate. If, for example, مكلف الرشيدة فأمر إليها, if she's someone who's responsible, wise, can you know manage her affairs and so forth like that, then the affairs up to her. فيما لو أسقط عن زوجها بعد المهر أو كل مهر, meaning it's her choice. If she wants to omit, remit some of it from the husband, or she want him to give all of it, that's her choice. You understand? That's her choice. She's she have the choice to do that. Okay. And it's not for anyone or permit for anyone to come take anything from that mahar, not uh, due to a choice, nor to instill in it, except that the contract must be complete. And this is something which falls in the hands of that woman if she wants to remit some of it or not. Tayyip. Now this is the part of our lecture. Sul ishra mubiyil um. Living with the woman in an unkempt manner, in a poor manner, is permissible for the woman to ransom herself from the marriage. In other words, she can ask for a khul'a. If the living, as Allah says, وَعَشِرُوهُنَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ Live with them harm and honorably, live with them in harmony. If they feel as though they are living in a catastrophic situation that isn't conducive for them, they can seek to ransom themselves out of the marriage by giving the mahar back, okay? One of the stipulations. Or the man can, and you know, they argue whether or not she should give back first and then the man remit some of it or all of it to her or whatever the case may be. That's different with you know, the scholars of fiqh. Type. So if the bad, they're living bad, then there's a way for her out. There's a way for her out. She can ransom herself out, Right? And it says, إِلَّا أَنْ يَأْتِينَ بِفَاحِشَ مُبَيِّنَ أَيْ فَلَكُمْ أَنْ تَعْدُلُوهُنَ لِتَتَبِ بَعْدِ مَا آتَيْتُوهُنَ Right? Except unless one who you have witnessed open sexual intercourse, then in that case, you might have grounds to take back some of the mahar you have given her or take back all of it because she have breached the contract between you two. The obligation of living with the woman in honorably because Allah says, وَأَشِرُوهُنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ and also paying attention to orf, the halat hukmah alay, in regards to the permissibility, um, the ruling upon it, due to the fact that Allah says with ma'aruf, and we know that Allah used this word ma'aruf, it is permissible, meaning orf, tradition, what we are accustomed to, what we do traditionally, is permissible, and is mentioned in number of numerous verses in the Quran, where Allah used the word ma'aruf, when Allah talks about 
the father being responsible for providing for the child. That he had to provide for the child and the mother while they in the weaning stage. That he provide for them their clothing as well as Allah says, bil ma'roof. ولكن هذا معروف الذي هو عرف لا يعتمد ولا يرجع إليه إذا كان مقالف لمعروف الشرع. And the principle is that whenever the custom or the tradition goes against the legislation, then you don't have to abide by that, nor do you have to rely on it or return to it. The custom has to be in agreement to the sunnah. So, for example, I give it to you. For example, if a woman stipulates to you that she don't want you to take another marriage, uh, another wife in the contract, and if you agree to this contract. Let best be. There's no problem with it. It can stand and it can hold. All right. The issue now, okay, if she goes far as saying it's haram for you or you know that you can't marry another wife, then that becomes a problem because now she's going against the shara. But if it's a stipulation that is honorable and respected within the legislation, and y'all both agree to it, then you honor that stipulation within the contract. طيب لابن الإشارة إلى أنه ينبغي للزوج أن يصبر إذا رأى من زوجته ما يقرأ. Brothers and sisters, I swear by Allah, this is the point of the lecture. We do not understand this. I'm speaking to myself first and foremost that this verse indicates to us that it is befitting that the husband have the utmost patience when he witness something from his wife that he dislike. Because when it comes to spouses, there is a pros and con situation. Do you not understand? Yes, it is. There is a pro and con situation. Okay? When dealing with the wives, when dealing with the children, when dealing with yourself, the man is being addressed here, even though the woman is required to have patience with her husband too. And another verse in Surah Nisa, Allah talks about that as well. However, the men are being addressed here because the men takes the leadership role. So you must exercise patience. This is why divorce is in your hand. Relationships are being destroyed because we're so quick, so hasty to just say it's over with. Throw in the towel, as Sheikh Sali Fuzan mentioned. So quick to throw in the towel. I'm not tolerating this. Who do you think you are? I'm not pitting up with this stuff. So forth and so on. But forgetting the very fact that it was okay when that man was pursuing you and you were being pursued you didn't feel this way it was okay right when sometimes the women do the pursuing all right it was okay when y'all was enjoying each other it was okay when things were going good it was okay that y'all overlook all of these things allah mentioned this allah jalla says how can you take something back from what you have given the woman when y'all both went in to each other? Y'all both enjoyed each other. And they also took a strong covenant from you, meaning the marriage contract. So how can you now come in and say, you know what? Give me all of that back. Since you don't rock with me, I'm taking that back. The car, I want that. Right? Get out my house. The clothes I bought you, I want that. You know, this, I want that. And they get petty and all this extra stuff happen because emotions are involved. So we have to be extremely careful with these things. When it was going good, none of these things were an issue. When it is not going good, it's not for you to display lack of impatience. You must display patience. Because there are certain things in those pros that outweigh the cons. Do you not understand? There are things in those pros that outweigh the cons. By themselves. Because Allah says, For If you dislike them, pay attention to what Allah is saying. فَعَسَىٰ أَن تَقْرَهُ شَيْئًا وَيَجَعَلَ اللَّهُ فِيهِ خَيْرٍ كَثِيرًا It may perhaps, it may be that you dislike a thing. Right? But Allah brings about a great deal of good through it. Alright? The result of it. And the Sheikh is going to talk about that. He brings that good for you. So look at that. Iman. If that woman has Iman, that's a pro that outweigh a large amount of cons. She has Iman, but she might slack. She has Iman, she might not be organized. She has Iman, she might not be upright to the standard that you believe she's supposed to be. But she has Iman. 
Do you not understand that? If she has Iman, and if she has Iman, and then she guards her prayer, you have to pay attention now. That's another pro that outweigh many cons. And this is what you have to look at. This is what you have to review. Her tongue might be sharp, but her tongue ain't sharp just because anything. Her tongue might be sharp as the ulama of the past from the salaf they used to teach us, right? As that beautiful hadith that I love, one of my famous hadith that I love, when the companion, Hudayfa, he came to the Prophet وسلم, he said, Ya Rasulullah, indeed my wife, she has a loose, sharp tongue. She speak to me harshly. And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam He responded and said Min aina anta min istikfar And I ponder on this hadith And I constantly ponder on this hadith The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Here the man is coming to complain to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam That my wife She you know She have a sharp tongue with me She speak to me in an ill manner Not might be even respectful And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says to him Where are you in regards to seeking forgiveness from Allah And I think to myself Why is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam telling him to to seek forgiveness as if he did a sin Right She the one disrespecting him He's coming to the Prophet ﷺ Because his wife is disrespecting him Why is the Prophet ﷺ telling him to seek a stick fall? And then I realize The Prophet ﷺ is mentioning to the man Where are you seeking a stick fall? Because if you fear Allah If you fear Allah Allah will rectify the situation Between you and your folks if you are upright with Allah, if you have a good standing with Allah, you have a good relationship with Allah, Allah will upright, will, will make and rectify that relationship with your spouse. The moment you slack, the moment you slack on your relationship, the moment you this, then seek Allah's forgiveness because you have failed. And then her mouth wouldn't be so vicious towards you. Do you understand? And that was a lot of wisdom in that what the Prophet ﷺ said. All right? So we have to constantly look inwardly when we see disobedience appearing at the hands of our loved ones, such as our wives and our children. Look inwardly. Do you understand what I'm saying? And just analyzing this and going over this, what about the permission of Allah Jalla We understand the importance of what? Patience. So the Shaykh he continues. He says, Fa because the result, right, the result, the outcome of being patient with that woman and not having no tolerance and not calling for divorce and not separating, right, the outcome might be praiseworthy. You don't know the outcome. Allah is in control of the outcome. That is why we need to understand Allah being in control. The outcome of any situation is with Allah. Right? In al hukmah in Allah, as Allah Jalla says in the Quran, that the judge and the ruling for all things, right, is with Allah. The decision and the matter of all things is with Allah. The outcome is in Allah's hands. Period. I don't care who you are. That's the outcome is in his hands. So that woman that you feel some type of way against, right, you have to realize that it might be a praiseworthy outcome, especially if she have these pros that Tremendously outweigh those cons That you believe that's a problem Her iman versus her sharp tongue Her iman versus her lack of knowledge Her lack of organizational skills Her lack of tending to things that you might want And your standard Her iman, her guarding her prayer Her guarding her chastity Is priceless If the woman do any of these things And the reason why I'm mentioning these things specifically Because this is what the Prophet ﷺ said إِذَا نَظَرَ إِلَيْهَا if he looks at her and he is pleased, <laughs> right? If he commands her with something and she obeys, if she guards her for our prayers, if she fasts her month, <laughs> this is what the Prophet ﷺ said. So he taught us to what to look for for pros in a woman and a wife, right? And these pros will outweigh those cons, the problems that you have. She's a believing woman. There is nothing greater than a believing woman. Do you understand? This is why you find the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that the best of enjoyments, khairu istimta, the ni'mat, the best of enjoyments in this dunya is having what? A mara'atul salihah. Having a righteous wife. Okay, so this is important for us to understand this as husbands. 
or as men or people who want to be married or in relationships we need to understand certain key factors and patient plays a tremendous component likewise you women you have to now look at the same thing if that man has iman and i'm not talking about if he have shahada right two different things huh what do you mean Yes, yes, yes. We know the ulama mentioned that anyone who's a Muslim has iman. We know that. We're not negating total iman from someone who have shahada. I'm not saying that. So don't go off the deep end on that. That's a different scholar debate that we're not going to go into right now. I'm not saying that you don't possess any ounce of iman because you have shahada. I'm saying it's two different things to claim shahada and to live shahada. Do you understand the difference? That's two different things. So a person having iman... Right? And a person having shahada and living shahada and a person having a person having claim in shahada is total difference. Because you can get with a guy who is handsome to you, you can get with a guy who has a long beard, you can get with a guy, but he's all for everything else than Iman. He don't practice Islam, he don't do any of the things, he have shahada, so forth, that's it. That's not gonna be good. That kind outweigh the pros. Do you understand? You understand this. This becomes clear. And this is why it's not your place to select a man. It's your guardian place to help you select a man. Don't ever forget that. Woman is not your role to go find a man. I don't care what I you go look through. I don't care what hadith you want to go look through. You can find a million avatars. You're not going to find nothing to support you. That is for a woman to go out and select a man. It's for the guardian to help direct the woman to make a good decision in selecting a man. Okay? Nonetheless, so you look, and if you see that man as a striving believer, that he believes in the law, and that he guards his prayers, and that he calls you to that which is right, then that outweighs the lack of finance that he might be going through. He might have a financial difficulty that he is experiencing, and you are required to have patience with that man because you know his iman outweighs the con. Do you understand? You're not going to go out and find another just because you believe that you is. Like, I have another you in a minute. It's not possible. And no, you can't. Because Iman is something that is a light and is only given from Allah. So not everyone is running around with it. So you can't say, oh, yeah, I'm going to leave you and I'm going to find somebody else and it's going to be. No, it sounds good. And I know social media make it look good because people hop in your DM and they tell you, you're beautiful and you're beautiful. That man is only worried about scoring. Okay, so I mean, I'm going to keep telling you beautiful, but trust me, that man don't want your problems. Trust me, he want what's in between your legs, but he don't want your problems. And the moment that you have those problems and you start, ah, ah, he going to look at you like you a mental case. Something wrong with her, right? You see? So you have to be extremely careful. You don't grow them like that. And you have to take in consideration because Allah Jalla says there's going to be a multiple people from the earlier generation that will be in paradise he said it's going to be few from amongst the latter generations and so that you know newsflash we are from the latter generations so that means there's going to be a lot of people going into the hellfire all right so and if that's the case you're not going to be out here finding total e-man individual this e-man that e-man you have to be extremely careful and if you got someone that Allah provided you and grant you the risk that that person is a believer in the law and that he believes that Allah is one and that he don't believe that anyone else should be worshipped along with Allah and that he prayed to Allah he might slack here and there on certain key things because you slack here and there on certain key things as well but that outweighs the cons that you have in your mind you understand this is why it's extremely important you might not get a man that's totally open or romantic like you want this is not a book nor a movie you might don't find that person likewise us men we might don't find that even though we are advised to look for an affectionate woman we might don't find a woman who is open and who is so romantic or can eloquently express herself or display her feelings to you all right because this is not a book and it's not a movie that's fairy tale right but you might find that woman striving to believe in the law priceless priceless so Allah Jalla is teaching us how to have patience 
Sheikh Uthameen says, how to have patience with the woman. Sheikh Uthameen says, what? أَنَّهُ وَإِنْ كَانَ حُكْمُ وَرَدَ فِي كِرَاحَةِ الزَّوْجَةِ فَإِلَّا عَامَّا فَكَثِيرٌ مَا يَقْرَهُ إِنْسَانُ شَيْءٌ وَيَجَ اللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلْ عَاقِبَةُ حَمِيدًا نَافِعَةُ لَهُ He says that because if you look at it, when كَانَ حُكْ وَرَدَ فِي كِرَاحَةِ الزَّوْجِ If this be the ruling in regards to what's being reported about disliking one's wife, then the exception is general. He says, فَكَثِيرٌ مَا يَقْرَهُ إِنْسَانُ There are many things, the abundance of things that... Uh, a person may dislike But Allah might make that thing Or the outcome of that thing Become praiseworthy and a benefit for that person So you might complain that the woman is She don't have organizational skills She not a great cook She not this and this and that But that woman might remind you of Allah Jalla wa ala. Something you're going through in life She might remind you Say the dua Ask Allah Jalla wa ala to forgive you That's priceless She ain't telling you to go out there man. You better figure out how to get it you're back against the wall, man. Ain't you a man? Go out there and get it, man. Any mean necessary. Knock somebody over the head. I don't care what you do. You don't got to tell me. Just go out there and get it. She ain't telling you to do that. She ain't telling you to go out there and, you know, do something haram or earn a law's anger. She ain't telling you to do that. No. She's telling you to fear Allah. Seek Allah's forgiveness. That's priceless. Do you understand? She's just priceless. That's the pros that outweighs the con. So you are required in this situation to exert the utmost patience with her. If a defect occur from her that you don't like, you better exercise and beg Allah to give you the courage and the patience to deal with her because she is priceless. Do you understand? Likewise for the husbands, you women need to pay attention to that. There isn't going to be the same. What we see on TV, what we see outside, all of this. You have to remember one thing that the Muslims have and the believer has over the non-believers. We know the reality of the dunya and they don't. We know that the dunya is a mirage. We know that. And if you don't know that, something is wrong in terms of you and your iman and understanding your iman. All right? Your iman gives you that, that king eye to look that this is gurur. Allah says it. Do not let the dunya deceive you. <laughs> Allah says it over and over in the Quran. You have to read it. It's a guru. That's what it is. It's deception. Why? Because it perish. It's not even everlasting. And it was made as a punishment for your parents in the first place. It was never to maybe. It was, and it's actually lowly. Right? And so, <laughs> you understand all of the different things that are con connected with the actual dunya and you know that it's fleeting and you know that it's not long why would you sit there and convince yourself otherwise when Allah gave you iman to see the reality of it so if you know that don't you be sitting out here looking at fulan and alan and thinking that they are the power couple they aren't the power couple the power couple is the two couples who got iman even if they live in a basement even if they live in a trailer even if they live in a hut even if they live in a mansion do you understand they have Iman, which is greater than wherever their circumstances are. That's the important things you need to understand. They have Iman. Why? Because if the mansion is taken away from them, they're not going to blow each other's brains out. They're not going to blame each other. They're not going to feel like the world is over. They're not going to be talking about hashtags, FML, F my life. They're not going to be talking crazy stuff like that. They're not going to be doing any of those things. Why? Because they believe in the law. They know that Allah is the one who gave them the mansion. Allah can take the mansion they know that they seek Allah forgiveness Allah increases them and in more favors do you understand this is what they know so this is the person you look for that outweighs that that's why it's important we need to realize what we're getting married for a lot of us when we get in these marriages we ain't even know we're a hundred a hundred with Islam we're not hundred hundred with Islam first of all Islam is not something that we even practice in day in and day out of our lives we practice certain aspects of Islam and they still have to take effect some men a lot of men, they might practice praying five times a day in the masjid. Alhamdulillah, they have iman. But it might don't go outside of that. Right? It might don't go outside of that. You might have some men, they might read the book of Allah. You might have some men, they might get sadaqah. You might have some men that do this, but it might don't go outside of what they're doing. But then you might got some men who lives Islam, breathes Islam, sleep Islam, and that's how they are. You have some women who actually are the same way. And when they get together, it's just more beautiful, right? 
But the problem is we come in and we probably ain't be living one-on-one 100% with our Islam. So then we come in and we start living according to our culture, which is permissible. As we see, Allah says, what? Live with them according to your tradition. Long as it don't go against what? As Sheikh Adamin said, long as it don't go against the legislation. You can live with them in tradition. Yes, you can. But you still should be governed by the book and the sunnah. You still should be governed by the book and the sunnah. Ask yourself right now, in the relationship that you're in right now, who judge your relationship? Who do you refer back to in that relationship? And you want to know why you have a rocky relationship? Because the book and the, the book and the sunnah is not your judge. If you're ignorant of the book and the sunnah, you can't use it as a judge. If she's ignorant of the book and the sunnah, then she can't use it as a judge neither. Right? Then it becomes a tug of war. And what we do with the rights is we throw it at one another. You supposed to give me my hawk. You take it. You supposed to give me my hawk. You fell short of my hawk. And you fell short. And it becomes like a tug of war. And then when we go read the book of Allah, we're looking for an ayah to go against our wife. See? That's how you're supposed to be. And then when she go read the book of Allah, she's looking for a verse to go against you. Or she's looking for a hadith to go against you. Or if you really get on her nerves, she's going to contact, if she can get in touch with the Wakil, she's going to contact the Mashid on you and say, yeah, he's this, he's that, he's that, right? All because this shows what? Our ignorance. And we don't know the book of Allah and the sudden. So we can't refer back to the book. And we can't refer back to the sunnah to actually say, no, akhi, may Allah Jalla wa'ala give you good in this life and the next. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make you the best husband I ever have. But you made a mistake here, brother. According to this, this is you made a mistake. I would prefer if you would have did it this way. Likewise, we don't even talk like that. I don't even, do you talk like that? You don't even talk like that to your folks. Do you? No, you, the more harsh we talk to one another, the, the, that's the love mixed in it, right? You know what I'm saying? Come here, ball head. Get over here, monkey. Right? And then that's the, the love, right? All that. But if you talk to your wife with some passion and respect, some ihtiram, right? <laughs> you might look crazy because that's not what we're accustomed to. We're not accustomed to saying, okay, come here, this time. We're not. It's just the honest truth. We're not accustomed to that. We have to work and build ourselves to that level, inshallah ta'ala. So the shaky brought some good points here, and I'm going to stop at this end point here. He mentioned that the word asas so that we can understand. He says, um, he says, this is something that, first of all, he says, well, had the al mahsus. This is something that, that that's definitely tangible, physical, and it is witness that the outcome is beneficial for the person if they are patient in regards that meaning if they dislike something and how often things that they dislike and that the outcome have become good for them, even though they can't see that it is good. However, usually that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises takes I mean uh yatahaqq is actualized okay he says if someone asks what do Allah mean by asa here because sometimes the word asa can mean rijab and sometimes it can mean uh tahqiq all right in other words it can be actual all right and in terms of Allah can it, it can be perhaps but when it comes to Allah it's wajib there is no perhaps about it so like for example you can say asa asa rajulu you can say that perhaps the man ate this or in hopes that he did this but you can't say that with Allah when Allah use Asa you better know that it's actually taking place alright there ain't no it ends about it so Allah says for Asa and takrahu shay'a wa yaja'alallahu fihi khayri kathira definitely Allah brings good he brings a a praiseworthy outcome in any situation so no matter how you might view the situation you might dislike it and you might Allah Jabal is going to bring a good through that situation be patient brothers and sisters in your relationships be patient brothers and sisters in your relationships use this measuring stick and i guarantee it will help if you fall short in being patient with yourself then you owe it to your spouse to be even more patient with them do you understand that if you fall short in being patient with yourself then you owe it to your spouse to be even more patient with them. Why? Because why would you, why would you treat them any less than what you would treat yourself? Why would you do that? You understand? So if you're going to be patient, then start with yourself. And if you're patient with yourself like you need to be, then it's going to be easy to be patient with someone else. Remember the love and affection that you have grown for one another. Remember that respect is required in the, in the relationship. It's not a choice. Respect isn't a choice. 
I respect this nigga when I feel like it. No, you cannot. If you're a woman, <laughs> you cannot choose when to respect your husband. You have to respect your husband. That's an obligation and it's an ibadah. Because by you respecting your husband, you are, com you, are com you are carrying out the commandments of Allah. Do you understand that? So it's required. And if you have an issue respecting men, you have an issue respecting men, you want to have an issue respecting your man. I don't care who you are. Respect is important, especially when it comes from a woman to a man. Ihtiram. Just like provision is, is, is important and stability is important, especially when it comes from a woman, from, from a man to a woman. A woman want to make sure that that man is stable and that he can provide and that he can provide stability and security. That is more him with any woman. I don't care who she is. I don't care if she's up. I don't care if she has a well good career. I don't care if she has a good salary. I don't care if she's rich. She's still going to be looking for these qualities in any man that she gets with. Do you understand that? Stability, security, all of those things. So, where you think all of that come from? That's an innate feeling that was given from the creator to each and every one of us. All right? The woman knows this is what the man's supposed to be doing. And a man knows that this is what a woman's supposed to be doing. A woman's supposed to be appreciative. Yes. A woman's supposed to be appreciative. Yes. And she's supposed to respect her man. Not if he gives. Not if he do this. Just to the fact she's supposed to respect her man. If you want proof of this, الرجال قوامون على النساء بما فضل الله بعضهم على بعض وما أنفقوا من أموالهم. Allah جل وعلا says that الرجال, right, are the قوام. They are the maintainer, protectors, providers, and the leaders of the woman. Due to what Allah has given them, a fadl over them, over the woman, and due to what they spend out of the woman, the woman is supposed to honor, respect her husband. And the Prophet ﷺ has mentioned in an authenticated hadith that the right and the haq and the status of the man is greater than the status of the woman. And that shows you that this ihtiram is supposed to be given from the woman. She's supposed to be appreciative. Also in the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, I was shown the hellfire and I seen that majority of its inhabitants will be women due to what? Because they will be ungrateful. Not disbelief. They will be ungrateful. So you should be working on being appreciative to your husband. Whether he brings in $10, $100, $2,000, $10,000, you are appreciative because he is fearing the law and he went about it and sorted it in a permissible way. And he strove and gave it his all. He didn't sit back and let you do all the work. He didn't sit back and live off you. He didn't sit back and put you down or all the things like that. He didn't do any of those things. He went out and worked. And bust his behind and dealt with everything he had to deal with so that he can provide for his family. That deserves respect from you. Want to know why? Divorce, if you don't know, in most cases, don't just happen out of the blue. There are stages that gradually lead to divorce. Divorce goes through a mental process. Divorce goes through a mental process. Before it goes to a physical process. Do you not understand? And if we pay attention to the signs. That leads to these things. We will be able to curtail them. We will be able to fix them. So that they don't lead to a physical separation. And we will be able to work on those things. This is why you have to. And I don't like to say renew or rekindle. You have to work persistently. To keep the admiration, the love, the fun, the chase, the hunt inside of the marriage. Do you understand? You have to work diligently to do that. And you woman, you cannot be talking about, I'm going to get dressed up to go with my friend. I'm going to get dressed up to go outside. I'm going to get dressed up to go to work. I'm going to get dressed up this. I'm getting dressed up so I want to look good for me. You can forget all of that. When you're married, you should want to look beautiful for that man. Who's your husband? This is also a part of ihtiram, respect. Do you understand? How can you get up, fix your face up, dial your face up and everything like that just for everyone else, right? Including yourself, but not the man. And then you wonder why there's no affection between you and him. He got to come home and look at a rag, a rag doll, all right? You don't, you don't, but then when you get ready to go out, then it's, 
Like, look at you. Why would he have to do that? Same way the man should make sure that he keeps up on his hygiene. He keeps up on his appearance. He keep a fresh cut. He keeps something nice on his feet, right? When he can, and he look, according to his capability, nice and pleasing to his wife. These are means to keep that love festering between you two. Do you understand? These are means. Henceforth, the Prophet Sallam, he advised the man, do not pop up. Do not come unannounced to your wife's house without giving her a warning before you come. What was the warning for her? The warning was so that the wife can freshen herself up, do whatever she needs to do to appear attractive in the eyes of her husband. That's an objective of a wife. She wants to look appeasing and attractive to her husband. We get so comfortable and so complacent, man, you can see me how I am. If you don't like the way you look, and women got a big thing with self-esteem. If you don't like the way you look, what makes you think that man gonna like the way you look? Right? Yeah, he love you. I'm in love, but you don't even like the way you look. Girl, I look a mess. Then actually you look a mess. But won't you work on looking good so that way it can be done? Give gifts. Gifts is important. Gifts is important. It ain't just a love language, but it's really important. Give gifts. I'm getting ready to stop with this advice, but think about it. Always constantly give gifts. Whether it's a card, whether it's a kind word. We are taught in Islam, a smile is sadaqah. A kind word is sadaqah. Helping someone is sadaqah. Repelling your evil from someone is sadaqah. All of these different things, even down to relationships, intercourse is sadaqah. Right? So we have been taught this in Islam. So give. Keep giving. Y'all in a relationship, give. You might don't you might can't go out and buy a big thing for your husband. He might can't go out and buy you this big thing that you want. But guess what y'all always can give to each other? Kind words. I can always offer dua for each other. How can you be in a relationship and you don't offer dua for your husband? We are so twisted as a people that we offer dua as sarcasm. And we all do it to certain extents, with the Allah. It's sarcasm. It's either between making dua against each other, which is prohibited anyway, and then on top of that, we're sarcastic with our dua. Yeah, may Allah give you what you want. I mean, who makes that? <laughs> where you do that? I can't, we can't find one narration that the companions ever did that to each other. Where they, we're going to be sarcastic with our dua. Don't you know dua is to Allah? You want good for that person. Do you understand when you make dua? Constantly make dua for your wife. Make dua for your husband. Ya Allah, grant him this. Make him firm. Whatever he lacks, you should be making dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala aid him in that. And whatever she lacks, you should be making dua that Allah aid her in that. This is advice that I need to take myself. We should be asking Allah to aid our spouses with these characteristics that we so want. Because sometimes we get caught up in setting standards and solemn expectations that we destroy the marriage without even knowing that we are destroying it. And it becomes destructive because you're pitting the woman or you setting the bar so high that that woman ain't going to never reach it because it's always going to be in your mind how that's supposed to be. And you don't even live close to that standard. You understand? So you got to be careful with that. Make realistic standards. Do they have Iman? That's a checklist. That's a realistic standard. Do they believe in the law? Right? It's Iman. Do they pray? Right? Do they fast when they need to? Do they guard their chastity? Right? Do they obey their husband? These are realistic standards when it comes from a man to a woman. From a woman, can he provide? Not provide first. Is he have Iman? Do he have good character? Realistic standards. Is he have good leadership role? What is leadership role? Leadership role is not having reputation on the block. Or people know his name or they know him in the master. That's not leadership role. All right? So you can forget that. Leadership role is having good management skills. Managing skills. In other words, when he can take the bills and he can budget right. When he can lay out the fact that we need to do this. We need to cut back on that. We need to move here. This and that. That's leadership role. Leadership role is when he knows that you are slacking on certain things. And he knows how to bring it to you so he can uplift you and bring you in. To the point where he wants you to be at. This is leadership roles. Is he a good leader? This is good standards. These are standards that you need to be looking at. Because these are standards that Allah set for the man. And the standards are just set for the woman. That's what Allah and his message is set for the woman. So these are the standards that you need to be looking at. Not no crazy standard that he need to have um, 200k in his bank account. You sound weird. First of all, if you're not even on that status. You ain't, How you deserve a man on that status? Tell me that. Right? 
If in Islam, it told us that we are to treat the woman according to the, maintain the woman according to what she's accustomed to. If you're not accustomed to having 200 grand in your bank account, because you didn't look at the economy today, right? Then how do you expect that man to have 200 grand? Oh, yeah, I'm going to go out there and get me a doctor. Like, what are you tripping, right? You're not even in that, in that field. So what makes the doctor look your way? Please, upstairs. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Right? What makes you think, honestly, that you're going to have in that status? You're not. So what you want to do is be realistic. I'm not saying you can't. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that you can't land you a person who is a doctor. I lost my can send you anything. Right? We're not saying that. But what I'm trying to get you to understand, please, out. What I'm trying to get you to understand is that set realistic standards according to Quran and Sunnah, and you will come out on top. Set unrealistic standards, you're not going to come out on top. You're going to destroy the marriage before the marriage even take off. Do you understand? Set realistic standards, man. All right? Finding somebody today who want to believe in the law, who's trying to fight to believe in the law, is priceless. Islam is going back to being strange, even amongst the people who claim it. So holding on to someone who holds on to their deen is priceless. Don't you see what's going on in front of you? So stop acting like you got a big plethora of choices to pick from. Because you don't. You don't have real live choices to pick from like that. Oh, I can get this guy. I get that guy. No, you can't because you might get weirdo. You might get this weirdo number two. You might get anything that's going on. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to be better spouses to one another. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to have patience with ourselves and with one another. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to use the Quran and the Sunnah to help us to have patience and to make dua for one another. Whatever we said that was incorrect in our translation today was definitely from ourselves and the shaitan. Whatever was correct is from Allah jalla wa ala subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alhamdi. Ashadu wa ala anta astaghfir tu bilalik. This talk was not about divorce. It was about the destruction of marriage, which was a lack of tolerance and patience. So that's why I didn't talk about divorce. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.